Okay, uh, hello everyone. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you for today's space security guest lecture that is organized by the Prague Security Studies Institute in cooperation with Charles University's Faculty of Social Sciences within the course of space security. Uh, Prague Security Studies Institute is a non-profit, non-governmental organization with an aim to help safeguard and reinforce individual freedoms in democratic institutions and seeks to illuminate select unconventional threats arising from authoritarian governments that challenge the transatlantic alliance and other partners globally. Uh, I'm pleased to welcome here with us Dr. Deganit Paikovsky. Uh, Dr. Paikovsky is a faculty at the Department of International Relations, Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and a non-resident scholar at the Space Policy Institute of the Elliott School for Foreign Affairs, George Washington University. Uh, today, Dr. Paikovsky will talk about the new space race and models of space competition. Uh, during the lecture, you can ask the questions through the questions and answer option that can be found at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and I will deliver your questions to Dr. Paikovsky after, after, the, after the lecture or her initial talk. So please do not hesitate to ask and uh, we will answer them later. Uh, Dr. Paikovsky, thank you very much for being with us today. And uh, if you are ready, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me just share the screen with you. Okay, can you see the slides? Perfect. Wonderful. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. I am highly grateful to you for the Prague Security Studies Institute and to Dr. Jana Robinson for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, I, I wanna say that I value the opportunity to hear you and discuss ideas regarding uh, space competition and the changing concept of space power. What I will talk about today and present is part of a work in progress. So this kind of discussions, um, uh, I value very much because it forces me to refine my own thinking, further develop my ideas, and eventually, hopefully also speed up uh, my research. So uh, let's, let's move on. Okay, um, we are back in a space exploration race, I would say, uh, but uh, the entire purpose of space exploration is changing as countries recognize the potential for long-term economic opportunity. So the current models of competition also differ. And in this talk, I will argue, try to argue that the future space race will be won not only by those powers whose technological advancements are more superior, but by those whose economic, legal, social, and political institutions are most innovative, uh, let's say also attractive and popular to other spacefaring nations and also spacefaring entities. So in this respect, uh, let me start by saying that to, to the best of my judgment, the United States has an early lead over China, obviously over Russia, but it has a long way to go in winning uh, this context. So the outline of my talk today will be divided into three uh, main parts. Uh, first, I will talk a little bit about technology and great power rivalry or competition dynamics. Then I will say a few things about the changing global space activity and the evolution of space power over the years from the 60s until uh, contemporary political affairs. And then uh, I will say a few things about the space race in the context of a future cis lunar economy. So, uh, great power rivalry or great power competition in the context of technology is often, often comprised of, let's say, three elements that need eventually to work together. Uh, so, first, let's take a look here on, on the green side. It's the development of assets and capabilities. Then obviously, if you have power and you want to become a power, you have to project it, you have to show it, demonstrate it. So that's the yellow circle over here. And eventually, a, a very important issue is the control of the technological diffusion through different practices and processes of co cooperation on one side and restriction on the other side. Over the years, we've seen different practices of selective and limited cooperation uh, of technological diffusion, as well as, um, let's say, limitations that eventually explain 
why over the years only a small group of countries became technological haves um, in different technological issue areas and others do not. And eventually also the same applies to space. So these practices often result, as I said, in differentiating between those haves, the technological haves, and the have-nots. So this group, this elite group of technological haves is what I call a technological club. So what, again, what is a technological club? So it's a political structure. It's a political structure that separates a small number of countries from the rest of the world, because as I said before, they have exclusive and unique capabilities that others do not have. But the community itself recognizes those who have the technology as superior, okay? Because there is a legitimacy for connecting superior political status with uh, technological capability. So another thing that it does is it highlights technological de development, not as just as research and development, but as a political practice. Therefore, it's a, a club or a technological club serves for interaction, for negotiation over the means and the symbols of power, of wealth and an influence. So the great powers use clubs, I call it this uh, three C's, competition, comparison, and cooperation. This is all explained in, in, in my book who came out a few years ago, um, titled The Power of the Space Club. But, but you have here different examples of different technological clubs from battleships or dreadnoughts, nuclear club, the space club, and perhaps in the future, also digital power or AI club. So, but eventually what do the great powers gain? They gain a strategic edge, they can tame their rivals, and they seek followers because without followers they cannot sustain their leadership. And this is something very uh, significant also in, in my talk today. Now let's move to look at the evolution of the space age through the perspective of the different meanings of space power. Um, from the 60s, we have this main thing that says uh, the power which controls space will, will control Earth. And probably this hasn't changed, but what is space power did change over the years. So using the club model to observe the case of the Cold War race to space shows that the superpowers as key players communicated this message to educate, to let's say socialize the international community to see space as a symbol and as a means of power. So justification or vindication of the question why go to space is that this is what great powers or great nations do. And in that respect, let me show you a very nice quote from President Kennedy that I like in particular. This is uh, from his very famous speech at Rice University in uh, 1962. And it demonstrates that in the early 60s and onwards, accomplishments in space were acknowledged as indicators of world leadership. And he says the exploration of space will go ahead whether we join it or not. No nation which expects to be the leader of other nations can expect to stay behind in the race, uh, in the race for space. So space programs were primarily governmental, driven by a national purpose, achieving space power was by mastering space tech spectaculars. So, and even then, I, I just want to know the space race was a multipolar or multi-power contest in which less, even less powerful countries aspire to get a seat at the table of the informal space club. This is something uh, to note. We don't have a formal space club organization. It's a political, it's an informal political institution. In, in practical terms, so first, uh, force buildup was by state space programs, 
projection of power was by accomplishments and of space spectaculars, and the control of space diffusion was um, exemplified by strict control, by limited cooperation, and with high asymmetry between the technological halves, okay, and between, uh, of course, the, the, the non-halves. Okay, so, and the competition was mainly for technological achievements and the public good supplied through national space programs served mo mostly diplomatic and security purposes. Um, and therefore, in the US, if we look at the US as an ideal type, then the center of gravity was NASA's civil activity focusing on these technological demonstrations. Let's take a quick look at this graph. I will show it again later uh, in my talk. Uh, what you can see here is the US space budget uh, through almost the whole of this space age from the beginning until about a decade ago. Uh, let me walk you through it. So in, in green, we see the NASA budget. In red, we can see the Department of Defense budget. And in blue, we see the total. Now I want you to just look at the NASA budget in the 60s, okay? And you can see that during this period, about three quarters of the total budget invested by the US government in space was directed to NASA's activities. And this exemplifies the meaning of space power at, at the time. Let's move to the uh, ne next phase of space power. So in the 80s, and especially in the 90s, the day-to-day -day uses of space technology for military activity, but also for civil, and you'll soon see commercial activities expanded and, and began to mature. And consequently, space assets and capabilities became real force multipliers. So the primary interest in space programs stemmed from seeing space as an enabler for various military civil uh, uses, but mainly at the time military uses. Uh, as a result, most of the national resources invested in space were allocated to the Department of Defense during this period, as we'll soon see again when we go back to the, to the graph. So when the Cold War ended, the government needed to cut their national space budget, budget because everything changed. The, the, the main competitor vanished. There was no um, justification uh, for these kind of budgets. Uh, and the United States leveraged uh, the private sector to sustain its space prowess. Um, and this is a very interesting story that, that is very much attached to the first Gulf War, Desert Storm in 1991. I will not go into it uh, right now. If you want, I can uh, explain later in the Q&As. Um, but at the time, and that started already in the 80s, it, this is the wave of privatization. Uh, so the government started uh, contracting uh, and working with the private sector, but as the Cold War ended and budgets dropped, this was a, a significant incentive to go even further uh, toward commercialization. So space power was achieved by mastering space tech as force multipliers, not just for, mainly for military, but not just for military uses, as well as large multilateral partnerships. What I want to say here that is, uh, and I didn't say that before, is as I describe it, the space power evolves. When we move to the next stage, it doesn't mean that space spectaculars are no longer meaningful. It's just that the center of gravity is changing. And therefore, there is still a need for some kind of spectaculars. So for example, in the 80s, we see NASA coming up with the idea of the Freedom Space Station, and later on in the 80s, for different reasons, which I, I can also uh, address later, uh, they changed that or redesigned the format to this International Space Station. But all of that is eventually, um, through the change of meaning of space power, 
to something that is for day-to-day -day use, for the development of actual use of space technology for the benefit of the economy, the benefit of different um, elements of the, of the market. So once the private sector actors were incentivized to seek out and profit from their market share, uh, we see outer space capabilities as no, no longer just diplomatic or strategic tools. Gradually, they represent this new frontier, new economic potential uh, that both the public and the private act sectors could, could benefit. So space power becomes more operational and leaning toward these uh, multipliers. And if we look for a moment on control of this tech diffusion, then during the Cold War, we, we still witnessed rigid controls, while in the post-Cold War in the 90s, we saw the early seeds of uh, commercialization. And as my, let's say, my value teacher, Dr. Scott Pace once said, this was time for the economy to emerge. Okay, and I truly believe, uh, believe in that. Uh, and in the 90s, we saw the, the first models of PPP, public-private partnerships, okay, uh, and greater international co collaboration and cooperation, even between former rivals. So coming back to this graph, let's take a look this time on the 80s, and now you see uh, an opposite trend in the allocation of funds in which most of the funding is allocated to the Department of Defense um, in the 80s. What you can also see is the drop in the total, in the defense, and even in NASA budget when the Cold War ends. And then a steady increase, but very, very, very slow or very mild increase in the budget during the 80s. This is because it was, um, uh, still very difficult to justify large expenditures. So let's take a look what happened in the world during this, uh, this phase. Okay, so this is what you saw earlier, but in the, in the previous, let me go back a minute, okay? This is just the American budget. Now, what we look here, what we see here, the, the red, represents the government, the global government spending. Okay, but what is what is interesting is the green, is the green line, which we see here. This is commercial revenues, and we see the um, we and we can see the growth. Okay, so in the absence of a clear enemy, and during this period in which the US and, and other governments actually had to face necessary budget cuts, as I, as I said before, but still wanted to develop space capabilities, uh, this is where we, we saw the early seeds of public, private, uh, I would say dual use partnerships gaining much more momentum in, in different fields of space activity, launching, remote sensing, of course, communication that existed even before, uh, but, but I would say launch and, and remote sensing, that was very significant and, and comprised of, um, a change, okay, a, a dramatic change. So this positively affected the space economy and gradually space activities began to expand from a civil military practice to a triple practice, defense, civil, and commercial. So can we say that this is still the case for space power? Is it enough to send your, your citizens to space to gain space power, especially when things look like this, or at least people start to imagine them? So in recent years, we see that the space race entered an age of economic competition. And winning this race requires the ability to leverage tools of economic power on the space program's behalf. Let's see, let's, let's start talk about that. So this is the, I would say the third phase in, in the meaning of, um, of space power. And what does that mean for competing great powers? 
So that was a fundamental change. And in effect, current great power technological competition, because it puts the private sector and the private sector entities at the heart of the competition. So the great powers put tremendous efforts in developing technological assets and capabilities in space, but they rely heavily on close collaborations with the private sector. So first of all, if you don't have uh, uh, sustainable, scalable private sector, then you're in a problem. Look at Russia, for example. So for this reason, the dynamic of the rising great power competition directly affects commercial activity and also the private uh, entities and, and vice versa, okay? The, the private entities, the commercial sector, they have a lot of political leverage also back on, on the governments. So for example, projection of power is not no longer achieved only by governmental demonstrations of national capabilities by space programs, but instead they focus on exerting political power over these commercial activities in these technological fields that we've just mentioned. So in this reality, a country's ability to harness the diverse capabilities of not a space program, but an ecosystem, okay? And I will, I will explain what it means and realize this ecosystem for the benefit of its national security is an element of great significance to its overall uh, power. Therefore, in order to achieve national security objectives to win the competition, this new reality creates now a need to develop not just a government strategy, but an ecosystem strategy, as well as policies, tools, and mechanisms for interaction with the private sector to make the most of this innovation in this ecosystem. So let me just summarize um, what we did up until this point. So we see the evolution of the meaning of space power shifting from technological prowess to mastering terrestrial force multipliers and now to space economy. And this changed the structures under which these capabilities are pursued. I just, I just wanna note one thing that in, in the background of it, we, can, we also see the development of mastering counter space measures. And this is something also very significant because it impacts uh, the meaning of space power, but in, in slightly different way or it complements this meaning of space power. So um, this evolution of the meaning of space uh, power from a, a technological prowess to space economy has also, as I said, changed the structures, okay, under which these capabilities can be pursued. So unlike in previous eras, space power in, in this economic age is derived from commercial and industrial activities. So as a result, national space programs um, no longer uh, um, solely count on a civil agency or a military agency. Um, this is no longer the goal of space powers. Instead, they are looking at creating what I, I termed, or it's not me who, who, is, um, who coined this expression, uh, is ecosystem, okay? Over the past five years, if we, or a little bit of five years, if we look at different national space strategies, we now see the goal of, an, of developing an ecosystem. And an ecosystem is a complex system where all stakeholders, and in this case, academia, industry, government, civil society, all work together to mobilize the capabilities necessary for this prosperous space economy for both national security and, and economic reasons. And the way this space ecosystem is, is or develops is built on, I would say, three tiers of national, I would say, economic space power, okay? 
So this slide shows these three tiers or layers of assets and capabilities, which all together compose this uh, national space tech power in this economic space age. So first, eventually we cannot do without national state capabilities, which allow nations some level of flexibility, of freedom of action um, to pursue their national objectives in re relation to other nations. But this uh, heavily relies on infrastructures of different kinds uh, for global, regional, or, and even also national activities. And these assets are not necessarily nationally owned, but, but they provide um, the ability to pursue national goals, goals and interact with other nations. And these infrastructures are not just technological, it's also economic, it's also legal, it's also the social infrastructures. And finally, for the research and development, for the innovation, there's also a great need for a scalable, sustainable industrial base and academia that provide the information, that, that develops the knowledge out of which these services, products, and infrastructure eventually will be able to differentiate between the technological haves and the haves nots. Another way, therefore, evaluating the balance of power is through national space ecosystems. So advancing large and comprehensive ecosystems, uh, we should note this is a privilege that is often reserved only for few powerful countries or constellation of countries such as Europe. Other countries um, need, to, need to calculate more cautiously uh, how they uh, interact here. Uh, most of the countries eventually need to make strategic choices, prioritize what they do, and they cannot have a large national space ecosystem, but usually what we see is that they focus on specific niche areas that, boast, uh, that most um, work in their favor for their either national security interest or economic objectives. Um, I come from Israel, as for example, Israel for many, many years developed a niche of remote sensing um, capabilities and mastering capabilities in small satellites for remote, for remote sensing out of deep security considerations for intelligence. So what is the role of governments in advancing a national space ecosystem? So we can look at different um, functions, okay? So space agencies or government bureaucracies are still very much important for advancing these national space ecosystems, but what they need to do, what they do, how they absorb their uh, functionality is, is changing. So let's say, first of all, I, and I see at least four uh, such uh, functions. First is developing and maintaining infrastructures that the private sector cannot supply. For example, basic science, human capital, um, GNSS, um, and long distance uh, communication. This is just a few examples. Um, then also providing um, funding for research and development and in different models. It can be from customers or partners. Uh, and also creating and advancing the socials, what, I, what, what we can call the social space technologies or infrastructures, okay? So that's the social order, the um, economic institutions, legal framework, um, et cetera. Regulations, for example, um, giving, providing licenses. And then also advancing the business-oriented environment in which the private sector can flourish. And that also include space diplomacy. Okay, assisting the private companies to enter this space business, uh, helping them advance their business, open doors to them, and create new opportunities, as well as um, decreasing 
their, their risk, okay? Assisting in the risk management. So creating and advancing new innovative structures and social order in space is significant to achieve attraction of the private sector. And I would say this also goes for the international uh, arena, uh, working with other partners, either as private entities or, or other governments. So leading powers need to advance the structure and the order on, on the global scale, taking into consideration not just their own techno-national interest, but also techno-global interests of other nations as well. So what do we do and how do you race for CIS lunar economy leadership, okay? Um, duplicating um, ecosystems on earth to space. So some may interpret the phenomena in which nations actively advance their national ecosystem as evidence that governments lose interest in space and leaving it for the private sector. But as we've seen, this is obviously not the case and governments are very interested still in um, great power competition in space. So mastering in space still provides them with great value. Um, so what do they need to do? Okay, the concept of what is space has, has changed. Okay, and, and this change also forces these great powers to change their uh, toolbox and adopt new mechanisms. So I would say that we are currently at a turning point in which space becomes not only a commodity or a strategic domain for which information is created and transmitted, but it, it is perceived more and more as a socioeconomic domain in which in the future humans will work and live on, on, a, on endurance, and scalable a way. So this is a deep and meaningful change and it requires re restructuring the institutions, um, interactions at national and international levels. Because as I said before, other countries are also pursuing national ecosystems. Uh, and if you want to sustain a global space ecosystem and be the leader, then the goal should be to incorporate other countries into the value chain of this national, this, this global space ecosystem, but how do you do that? Okay, so in this reality, states or governments, they serve as the facilitators of this socioeconomic change. And this is not just working on, on technology, but mainly on on these uh, uh, legal economic tools. So such efforts demand national and international interactions and partnerships with the private sector and also with these different countries. So given that many of the private sector entities uh, in space and their products are American, does it necessarily assure, first of all, their full commitment with the US interest or the American vision so this, there should be um, thoughtful consideration of assuring their commitment um, and attracting, attracting them to be a positive element in the leadership uh, of the US. Uh, more specifically, we want to, we can ask how to engage them, how to engage with international partners, what kind of processes and practices will achieve the most favorable technological diffusion, for example. Um, how to promote favorable technical standards that shape global regulation. So as I said at the beginning of my talk, competing great powers want to tame their rivals and therefore they seek partners. And we are now again in great, uh, in, in highly intense great power rivalry so the objective of taming rivals is, is on the table. So also seeking followers or seeking partners is important as well, okay? It's, it's again, something to consider. And seeking partners rests on recognition, on legitimacy. 
from other nation states. So what is the way to earn this recognition? Uh, and the best way is through attraction. Uh, but how do you attract them? So in order to enhance um, their position, I would say that great powers need to compete now, not just between themselves, but on the attention of the international system. Each of the great power aims to attract others into some form of closer relationship with it, and the way to achieve it is through, is through partnerships. But fruitful and efficient national and international partnership, partnerships require a dialogue. And in some cases, and especially in this economic uh, age of space, it also means awarding some partnership in, in the leadership. So reading through uh, one, uh, uh, one version of the report on the state of the space industrial base that came out a few years ago, this report has been coming out, um, I would say in the last three, four years. This is, this is this quote I took from the version that came out in 2020. And it shows that there is understanding about the importance of maintaining uh, and advancing partnerships. This is the, the, an, an American report, if I didn't say that uh, before. So, but nevertheless, the traditional approach of the US to establish, establish partnership in the field of space is that in which the US sets the dominant, uh, dominant uh, tone, okay? Um, I will show you this nice cartoon from the 60s. Be our guest, okay? Uh, I would even say uh, everything has to be our way. Um, so see, for example, uh, uh, this, this quote, a central challenge for the US is defeating our adversaries' efforts to pray away our allies and partners through offers of joint participation in the development of global platforms and international infrastructure and wealth, including space development. But how do we achieve that? The challenge for the US now is to adopt a more inclusive form of leadership of technological development initiatives, as well as the same goes, not just for technological initiatives, but for the socioeconomic management of space as well. So it's not, it's not just, international leadership, but it's international partnership in the leadership, which will help uh, attracting um, or being more attractive to allies and partners. And with that, uh, we come close to the end. I want to say a few things about the Artemis Accords. Um, one of the symbols um, the U.S. is using in its, in its new space competition is the Artemis program. But to complement the technological, uh, the technology program, it also initiated, for, for the reasons that I've just stated, it initiated three years ago in May 2020, NASA together with the State Department, they initiated the Artemis Accords, not the program. Uh, and this is a first step toward filling this socioeconomic objective that I've been talking about over the past half, half an hour uh, and leveraging the American technology uh, or the American Artemis program. So the Artemis Accords, uh, with these accords, the U.S. wants to prove that it is more compelling, it is, it is a more compelling partner uh, for long-term space cooperation and governance than what China or Russia uh, have to offer. Although um, they haven't provided an official alternative to these accords, but they did launch their own plans um, of competing in this uh, space uh, domain, especially China, and building coalitions. So in a way, the U.S. has some kind of a lead in this case in putting the first um, initiative of, uh, let's say, rulemaking. Uh, so the accords establish a set of principles for how do you operate on the moon, 
for both uh, public and private entities that seek to establish a presence in the future space economy, the seas lunar economy. Um, so far, over 20 countries have signed, uh, including traditional parties such as the United Kingdom, Japan, uh, as well as uh, emerging space friendly nations such as Australia, the UAE, Nigeria. Um, to this ad audience, I would say that the Czech Republic only joined recently, and maybe this is the reason why uh, it's still missing from this image that I took today from the NASA website. So despite having uh, um, built this broad multilateral coalition, several of the US uh, key partners, including Germany and India, have voiced a significant concerns about these uh, accords. And so far, they've refused to, to sign them and join them. Others who are uh, part of this uh, alliance, such as Nigeria and the UAE, are also collaborating with China. So we can say that to many, the accords come across the unilateral attempts of a superpower of the US to impose its will and by extension also uh, its own values on this international system by um, establishing first the field of action, the rules of the game and setting, and setting the agenda for the next decade or, or decades, okay? Uh, for lunar, both lunar exploration and even more significant exploitation. So, the Artemis Accords are a good start, but if the United States wants to realize its ambition for leading the space economy, it must be more attentive to the needs of those who make up its support coalition and also the supply chain, the technological and economic supply chain, providing them some partnership in the leadership. In practice, uh, there is a need for developing strategy and taking actions uh, in three main issue areas. First is developing a communicative strategy that will help to design confidence building measures at the national and international level. This may be achieved using methods of, uh, let's say, verbal fighting, positive projection of power, and also by taking actions that contribute to the sustainability of space for, for all. Second is developing strategy and mechanisms to make leadership more inclusive. For example, allowing uh, national and international partners whose partnership is of great significance, some leadership, okay? Uh, at some cases, this means assisting allies and partners to get a seat at the table. And where that is not possible, perhaps even helping them create a new table, a side table, uh, in case of less powerful partners or less capable ones, seeking membership in this uh, leadership or this club, one, one may consider ways of uh, integrating them into the value chain of space economy, helping them along the way um, in a way that will be of great value to them, giving them some kind of bridges. Third, to put efforts in innovation and development, not only uh, on physical technologies, but on social technologies and uh, institutions, norms, practices, in a way that favors not just the leading power's interests, but also the interests of its partners. So last slide and three takeaways. I would say that the United States has an opportunity ahead of it today, but it needs to demonstrate that its vision for the future is built on meaningful trust and partnerships. So three things. One, to take out from this talk, power, space power shifts from impressive national technological achievements to advancement of a space economy. Second, leadership will depend on innovative, scalable, and committed 
industrial base, and third, and I would cite uh, Dr. Jan Werner, former head of the European Space Agency, who said, competition is a driver, but partnership is an enabler. So advancing leadership will eventually depend on the partnerships. And with that, I end. And thank you very much for your attention. I look forward to the discussion. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much for highlighting crucial issues related to the global space competition that uh, we are currently having. Uh, maybe I would start with the first question because you touched upon the Artemis Accord. So I, I would maybe ask if you can highlight what, what are the advantages of Artemis Accords and also why, why should even the small nations like the Czech Republic should, should join them? Um. It's, it's a good question. It's, it's a wonderful question that I have to admit that I believe also in Israel, uh, they had to face before deciding to, to join. Okay, and this is the, I, I think it goes to, how do you see the future? If indeed we are going to a cis lunar economy, okay, an extension of our existence beyond living on earth, although now it sounds like uh, science fiction, but, but it's not going to be, okay? Uh, over the last, uh, let's say, century, we've seen a lot of science fiction ideas becoming reality. So I think also small countries need to ask themselves, what role or what share do we want from this new economy? Okay? Um, in a way, I believe we can um, make the analogy of leaving Europe and going to the new world, exploring and discovering the new world. And we know that those who did it quite early, okay, um, had an advantage. And the same applies today, okay? If you um, identify this trend soon enough, and you hop on the train on time, then you're better suited to get more privileges and find your own unique uh, niche in this large developing uh, space economy, okay? It's not that the Czech Republic is going to compete with the US, okay? Israel is not going to become a, an economic space power, obviously, um, on, on all, on all issue areas, but each country has to see how it fits well and how it brings value in this new economy to bring back prosperity to its own citizens in this global set of um, space being a significant element of national security, national economy, and eventually the structure of, of power, okay? The stratification of, uh, of different countries. I, I hope I, I got that. Yes, uh, thank you. And maybe in this connection, it would be also interesting to ask maybe how two Chinese or Russian strategies compare to those of the United States and its allies and partners in terms of innovation and attractiveness for spacefaring efforts or, or partners. Uh, maybe, maybe also, why is it not so advantageous to, to join to join them? Okay, that's that's a good question as well. Um, I would say first, let's start with with Russia because that's the, I think, the easy case. Um, Russia, the the Russian space power, hardly relies on economic elements at the moment. They, 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 they did not, I think, realize, realize in time the significance of this change towards space economy and did not develop uh, the needed infrastructures in, in commercial sector and, in, and they, they do not have, they do not have a scalable, sustainable industrial base. Uh, and up until now, as, as I think Clay Maltz uh, describes that very well in his recent works, saying that um, 
the Russians build their space power mostly on military, okay? Mostly on military force uh, and state-owned uh, entities and capabilities. And therefore, when we talk about the future space competition or the future space economy, we often um, address the US versus China and we hardly talk about Russia. Now, now let's say a few things about, about China. China is moving fast and it's moving fast on the technological infrastructure. So far, it did not build um, strategic partnerships um, aiming for a, for a cis lunar economy. It, it is building its partnerships when it comes to terrestrial space, uh, let's say force multipliers, um, communication, satellites, uh, and, and so forth as part of the, of let's say the digital uh, Silk Road. But when it comes to the cis lunar economy, so far, it's building, it's, it's, it is focusing mainly on the technological infrastructure. The U.S. Was, was the first to identify the need for something similar to the socioeconomic framework, and this is the Artemis Accords. And this is why I think at the moment, it has a potential to eventually lead. The question is how and for how long and, and how deep it will be sustained as attractive to its partners. Yes, thank you very much for this uh, exhaustive answer. Uh, I, will, I will move to the questions from the audience. Uh, based on the idea uh, that socioeconomic, legal, and cultural strength win the space race, do you think that building national narratives around space is a component of this strategy? Again, can you repeat? Uh, uh, the question is basically asking uh, if uh, building narrative uh, around space is a component of the strategy, uh, uh, the strategy of winning the space race in this oh, global yes. space competition. Yeah, I, I think so. Yes, the short answer is yes. Okay. Uh, the next question: uh, Given the current international status of Russia, do you uh, how do you think the Chinese narrative around the multilateral moon mission will change, or if you expect any changes? I, I don't think that for China, the significant other is Russia. I think the significant other in this competition is the US. And therefore they're looking at what the US does more than the, what they're looking at, at Russia. Uh, if the question was in terms of partnerships, uh, yeah, they may work to attract them to their side, but the question is what will they have to offer and what kind of function they can fulfill in, in what the Chinese will build as the value chain of the, their space ecosystem. Thank you. And I would maybe also ask uh, how we should maybe leverage uh, space partnerships also in the term how, how what strategies should we, should we maybe use or apply for keeping pace and safeguarding leadership in uh, global space competition. Maybe also how, how to how to support industrial base and academia in this sense. You're asking from the perspective of a great power or the perspective of a small country now? Well, maybe it would be interesting to know both. The the challenge for the you know small countries is eventually prioritizing. And and when you are a great power, it's easier to allocate significant. Uh, funding uh, for developing industrial base. When you're a small country, then comes the question, why do we need to prioritize space over other issue areas? And, and when you do uh, decide to, to pick space as something to prioritize, what do you prioritize in, inside? Uh, I think that the greatest challenge today is to is accessing space still. I think another challenge is through regulations. And, and another thing is to open up the space community 
to other commercial communities. I think that, that a great challenge today is to make, um, let's say the non-space entities understand that they can benefit uh, space products, either in space or on earth. I think there's still a big gap uh, in in this in in this uh, uh, in this juncture in this cross cutting issue, okay. Many industries don't necessarily understand how they can value space data. So I think when you want to develop your industrial base in a large country in a small country, this is something to think about. And this is uh, an important function of the government to connect these communities of practice together. Yes, thank you. Uh, you also talked talk quite a lot about the importance of building this whole uh, ecosystem. So uh, I would maybe ask uh, what is the role of uh, this new space startup companies in this global space comp competition and how, how they maybe they can contribute to winning this space race? As, as they do to other economic um, issue areas, okay? It's a lot of innovation coming, uh, coming up from these uh, high-tech companies, uh, but also they have unique challenges uh, that I think um, national bureaucracies need to understand how to work with. Um, and, and I think this is a challenge, okay? This is not just an opportunity. This is a, first and foremost a challenge for uh, government bureaucracies to learn to work and to understand the needs of uh, small startups. For example, small startups need national bureaucracies to act fast, to make decisions for them fast. Usually they cannot wait uh, a year or two years for decisions to be made. On, on funding, for example. Um, but once you do learn how to work with them, I think they can they can bring a lot of innovation because of the fast, um, usually fast circles that they can they can close up uh, being being so small and so adapting to change very quickly. But but this is a challenge for government bureaucracies who are not used to working. Uh, with this new vibrant environment. This is, a, I've, I've been hearing that from uh, many actors in Europe and also uh, in Israel and North America. Um, we all talk about how good it is, how wonderful it is to uh, sustain and advance this uh, high-tech sector, but not many really understand how to leverage that. Okay, thank, thank you very much for, for, for your answers. Um, there are no more, no more questions. Uh, I would close this session for today. So uh, let me once again thank Dr. Baikowski for, for being with us today. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, of course, I thank you the rest, uh, the rest of you uh, for joining us today. I wish you a lovely rest of the day and hope to see you during our next Space Security Guest Lecture or some other PSSI event. Thank you very much again for the opportunity. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.